Good evening, good evening, brothers and sisters, and welcome to this, the first in our lecture series of our Kwame Ture Memorial Lecture Series, staged by the Emancipation Support Committee of Trinidad and Tobago. We are very happy to have you with us, and we thank you for spending this time with us. It's in, in fact, our 30th year, the anniversary of the start of our organization 30 years ago. And it's also the 26th year to date of the anniversary of Kwame's first lecture in Trinidad and Tobago. So we are very proud to be here today and to welcome you to this series that will go on from now until the end of July, when we then celebrate emancipation on the 1st of August. So have a good evening and enjoy the presentation. Please join us now in recognizing the national anthem of Trinidad and Tobago. <laughs> Our chairman for this afternoon's program is our esteemed Director of Education and Research, Dr. Claudius Fergus. Dr. Fergus is a retired senior lecturer in history or in the Department of History of the University of the West Indies, St. Augustine campus. He's a specialist in the abolition of the British colonial slavery and in the transatlantic slave trade. He has written extensively and researched African history in the region and in West Africa. He has documented his experiences and the history of slavery and its effects on West Africa. Dr. Fergus has investigated the late 18th century militarization of Africans and their descendants during the Haitian Revolution and in the wider Caribbean. As an author, Dr. Fergus has published many books and research papers, some of which are Dread of Insurrection, Abolitionism, Security and Labor in British West, Indi West Indian Colonies. Excuse.
and his most recent publication, Revolution and Emancipation and the Abolition of Slavery, published in 2013. I give you Dr. Claudius Fergus, our chairman for this afternoon. And I do apologize, I forgot to turn off my phone. Forgive me, it won't happen again. Thank you and good afternoon. Thank you, Sister Hazel. I also want to warmly welcome all of our audiences as we launch our 2022 edition of the Komituri Memorial Lecture Series. This series has been an annual event on the Emancipation, Commemoration, and uh, Pan-African Festival calendar since 1993, when it was then known as the Emancipation Lecture Series. Following the return to his homeland in 1996, the lectures were named in honor of Kwame Ture. Saying so, I am thinking of Matnikan Pan-Africanist, Amos Zez, epic poem, Return to My Native Land, which speaks to the revolutionary awakening of black consciousness, or negritude as it was then called, by Pan-African intellectuals in the then French colonies on both sides of the Atlantic. And of course, the title of this year's lecture is about Kwame Ture's return to the land of his birth. The lecture is entitled Kwame Ture in Trinidad and Tobago, Revisiting Black Power. You know, just the mention of emancipation at this time of the year always invokes memory of the heroic Haitian people for the great human sacrifices that they made for the advancement of human freedom and human rights between 1791 and 1804. Some 100,000 Haitians were killed in that war of emancipation and independence. Of course, as in all wars or most wars, nobody knows the exact figure. It was the Haitians that started the process of destroying the slavery systems in this hemisphere, culminating with Cuba and Brazil in the 1880s. The French, with America's backing, made the price for freedom in Haiti even greater than the blood that they spilled by imposing the well-known ransom that they call indemnity. Let us always remember Haiti. We pay homage to them. Dutty Bookman, Cecile Fatima, Toussaint Louverture, Jean-Jacques Dessalines, and all the, of the other revolutionary heroes. We honor your memory. Kwame Ture could not be Kwame Ture without your victory over the greatest inhuman system known to history. So at this time, let's enjoy a short video on the great freedom fighter Kwame Ture. This clip is taken from a documentary called A Man of the People, and we want to thank its director, Mr. Yao Ramesa, the chair of the Film Institute at the UWI St. Augustine campus, for the privilege of sharing his work with us. what we mean by the term the people because everybody is always doing something for the people <laughs> so we want to know exactly what is the people of course we know from the word people and uh, when we say the people we mean all the people but now when we say the people we don't mean all the people in uh, Western democracies where they try to confuse people with form not with content they will have you believe that the majority is the people. Of course, the majority is a simple form of vote. A great man, a noble son of Africa, Sekou Toure, said, if I'm walking down the street and there are 15 thieves on the corner, 
And these 15 thieves have decided what to do with me. And there are two proposals. One says they should steal me and beat me. The other one said they should steal me and kill me. And they have a vote. And 13 vote to steal me and to kill me. Is this a democratic vote? No. So when we speak about the people, we're not just speaking about the majority and those who vote. We're not speaking about form. We're speaking about essence. Essence. The essence of the people is to make the world better for those who come after them. This understanding of the people is instinctive. When we speak of the people, in the sense certainly of the Africans, we speak of a people who respond against oppression in a mass manner, massive indeed. Certainly if you look at the independence movement in Africa, if you will look at the mass movement in Britain when the Africans there rise up against racist terrorism, if you will look at the mass movement in America where Africans there just uh, rise up and uh, commit urban rebellion, if you look even at the Caribbean during the independence movement, you will see nothing more than mass movement. The people, when they come together, have a collective instinct. And this collective instinct is a just instinct. Now, some people will get confused, but the reason why those of us who are revolutionary can have blind faith in the mass of the people is because we know they have just instincts. And you can always mobilize them easily. History certainly gives a lot of examples that will show us that in order to mobilize the people, you must depend upon their just instincts by making just statements. There are two classes. There is the people class and there is the anti-people class. The anti-people class is that class of people which are not concerned with the interests of the masses, are not concerned with the poor. They're only concerned with their own interests, their petty interests, to advance themselves economically by any means necessary. The anti-people class, those small minority who exploit the people, they are well organized. Not only are they well organized, they have under their control all the machinery necessary to coerce the people. Today they have the media, they have the schools, they have the churches, they have the police, they have the army. It's because the people are not organized that the people suffer. Now we can transform this by having the mass of the people become properly organized. This is the only way that the people can advance history. They advance it all the time, but they advance it unconsciously. If we were to take an example in the United States of America and look at the Africans there, we could say that unconsciously they have advanced their struggle by going from burning plantations to burning cities. Of course, all this is unconscious. We can clearly see it in the case of Rodney King Rebellion, where in 1992, without planning, without discussion, without anything, they just jump up all of a sudden and carry out this activity. It's mass characteristic. We explained it in the beginning about the character of the Africans when it comes to the people's instincts for justice. We must tell you the reason why the people do not have power after all of these years of constant struggle against such backward systems like slavery, like feudalism, and now capitalism, is because the people are not organized. We must now come to be an organized people. Therefore, as a man of the people, my central task is to organize the masses of the people. Our party, the All African People's Revolutionary Party, and our party, the Democratic Party of Guinea of the African Democratic Revolution, preaches, begs, imposes, comes to ask all those who really want to help the people to organize the people. And the people themselves will get organized once each and every one of us join an organization, a political organization, that's fighting for the people. This is how the people will win power. Okay, it seems that I was muted, huh? Just in case you didn't hear me, I took one key word from that documentary, that clip from the documentary, and it's organized. 
and it reminds me of Marcus Garvey's um, uh, axiom, organization is power. And uh, we can see the continuity in uh, the leadership, uh, the thinking of the leadership of black consciousness and black empowerment from, from Gavi, in fact, even before, right down to, to Turi and beyond. And um, at this point, we are going to take in one of the leading dance and drumming groups in Trinidad and Tobago. They are the Wasafuli, and uh, we are going to get a little piece of entertainment at this time. So. Thank you, Wasa Foley, for a great performance as usual. We now come to the main event. The Kwame Ture Memorial Lecture Series is the Emancipation Support Committee's main public education forum during our Pan-African Festival. The theme of this year's uh, lecture, the theme of this year's festival is study years. That's 1992 to 2022, transformation and resilience. Our featured speaker for this year's event is a young British-born Trinbegonian Pan-Africanist whose parents hail from Tobago and St. Vincent. He was born in Britain, but spent some part of his youth in Belmont, Port of Spain, the same suburb where Kwame Ture was born some 90 years ago. I hope our featured speaker will add his voice
to our call in Trinidad and Tobago for the renaming of Oxford Street, where Kwame Ture was born, to Kwame Ture Street. Our featured speaker is now based in the United States, pursuing a PhD program in the Department of Literatures in English at Cornell University. But he will be speaking to us this evening from Dakar, the capital of Senegal in West Africa, where he was once based as a journalist for three years, covering West Africa, including the Gambia, Guinea, Mauritania, and Mali for Al Jazeera, the Middle East Eye, and the Daily Telegraph. He was a trainee on, channels four, on Channel 4's investigative journalism program. He has reported from a dozen countries, including Chile, Trinidad and Tobago, and Switzerland. Additionally, he has contributed uh, to The Guardian, BBC Radio 4, Jacobin, and Vice. He is the author of Becoming Kwame Turi, a book that was published in 2020 about Stokely Carmichael's time in Africa, when, of course, that consciousness in his Africanity compelled him to change his name from Stokely Carmichael to Kwame Turi. Let us welcome our feature speaker, Mr. Amanda Thomas Johnson. Welcome, my younger brother. I want to thank you for accepting our invitation to deliver this year's feature lecture on the launch of the Kwame Ture Memorial Lecture Series. Thank you and so much. now we go over to Dakar. It's all yours, brother Amanda. Thank you so much um, for your kind introduction. Um, I'm honored. Um, and humble to be here today. Um, not least, as you mentioned, my parents grew up in, in the Twin Islands of Trinidad um, and Tobago. Um, I'm going to talk today about uh, Kwame Ture's uh, life um, in Guinea, um, a part of his sort of public biography um, that is often um, sort of missed or even suppressed, um, in fact. Um, I want to start by sort of honoring the ancestors, um, uh, my, my immediate ancestors, which, which are my parents. Um, so I think that will sort of um, give you an idea um, why this story, why Kwame Ture is important to me and how um, I came to actually write about Kwame Ture as well. Um, so, you know, like, like Ture, uh, both of my parents grew up in Trinidad. And one of the earliest recollections of my mother, Yvette Thomas, is of attending a concert by Miriam McCabe, Ture's future wife on the island in the early 60s. She told me that this concert actually instilled in her a love of Africa that would last, still last um, today. As for my father, Buzz Johnson, who was born in Tobago, but brought up in Faisabad, in the south of Trinidad, he witnessed the 1970 Black Power Revolution firsthand. His contribution to the revolution had been to make Afro combs out of bits of wood and metal rods. But a decade later, after he moved to London, he set up a press, a carrier press, its publications ranging from poems from the National Liberation Movement in Namibia um, to report about police in inner city London. He'd been electrified by the Black Power Revolution, which Kwame Ture, of course, had himself influenced. When my father spoke of Ture, he always zeroed in on the fact that he had re relocated to Guinea and took the names of Kwame Nkrumah and Sekou Ture, becoming Kwame Ture. He spoke with rare excitement, but offered little in detail, but ha perhaps because there wasn't much out there about this period in Ture's life. Nevertheless, it was to me striking that my father focused on this latter part of Ture's life. In June 1996, little more than a couple of years before he passed away, Kwame Ture returned home to Trinidad and Tobago at the invitation of the Emancipation Support Committee. The trip marked an important homecoming for the activist who in 1966, then known as Stokely Carmichael, had resuscitated the call of black power, radical self-organization, militancy, and self-respect. Resuscitated because as James Baldwin once wrote of Ture, he didn't coin it, he just dug it up from where it's been lying since the first slaves hit the gangplanks. That call echoed globally, not least in Trinidad and Tobago, 
with the Black Power Revolution in 1970 brought the country to a standstill, causing petrified British High Commission officials to worry that Prime Minister Eric Williams would be toppled and replaced by Touré, and for Williams himself to ban Touré from returning to the country of his birth. His 1996 visit then was therefore his first legal appearance in Trinidad and Tobago for over 30 years. Legal because in what you might call typical Touré fashion, he had already sneaked into the country once or perhaps twice before. According to his account of the trip in his autobiography, Ready for Revolution, Touré was received by the Prime Minister, Basio Pande, on the first day of a four-day schedule, during which he also visited Tobago and addressed inner city youth. He remarked on the country's enduring beauty and the massive economic development fueled by petroleum wealth, which nonetheless seemed to him to be somewhat unevenly spread. However, Touré by now cut a frail figure. He did not have long to live as the cancer progressed. And so the hero's welcome was at the same time a final farewell on this, his last trip home. Yet Touré was far from a spent political force. Activists from the 1960s had either been assassinated, as was the case with the other two towering figures of the civil rights, Black Power era, Malcolm X and, the, and Martin Luther King, or they had been incarcerated or just given up politics altogether. Not only was Touré still alive, but he was still politically active, a fixture on the global Pan-African scene. This point seemed clear to the crowd who had gathered to receive him at the National Heritage Library on the morning of 12th of June, 1996, exactly 26 years ago today, amid much drumming and fanfare. According to a report in the Trinidad Guardian that day, Touré was dressed in loose-fitting flowing apparel with matching headpiece, everything a light, cloudy, bluish, greenish color. On his feet, he wore white pointed slippers reminiscent of Moroccan royalty. Indeed, he was the image of no good bearing. The report goes on. One could feel the excitement as many of African descent eagerly awaited, acting as though a messiah were coming. To them, he was the embodiment of black struggle against a world dominated by white power structures. Kwame Touré, known to most as Stokely Carmichael, had arrived. And it adds, passionately he voiced his views, the revolutionary within him bursting forth at every opportunity. He spoke of revolution and change. He stated that change comes about only through conflict, both violent and nonviolent. He stressed the need for education and the ability to think. Tory's trip capped a life of revolutionary activity, yet the biographical record tends to focus on the years he spent living in the US, where he rose to become, alongside Malcolm X and Martin Luther King, one of the significant figures of the Black Power civil rights era. In fact, his political biography far exceeds the mere 16 or so years he spent living in the, in, in the US. People are often surprised to learn that Toure, in terms of his birth and upbringing, was a Trinbagonian who left for the US at the, at the age of 11. This isn't just a trivial fact, but crucial to understanding his political trajectory. For instance, we know that he received an early political education from an Aunt Elaine, a trade unionist who was a supporter of the great labor leader, Uriah Buzz Butler. Later, shortly after he moved to the US, he was introduced by a cousin, revealingly another woman, this time named Innes, to the step ladder speakers of Harlem's 125th Street, remnants of the Garveyite movement, which included the formidable Queen Mother Moore, and these helped to instill a sense of African pride and duty toward African people in him. It is not hard to see the clear black thread running from Garvey's injunction to emancipate, your, emancipate yourself from mental slavery through to Touré's demand for black power, black self-respect, a thread that runs through to another figure who had an early Garveyite influence and Caribbean parentage, Malcolm X. But by far the largest period missing from Touré's biography is the nearly 30 years he spent in Guinea. One authoritative biography of Touré devotes a lone chapter out of 16 to this period, which amounts to more than half of his life, while The Economist magazine gloated that by the time of his death in Guinea in 1998, Touré was not much more than a non-entity. So what was Touré during, doing all, these all this time in Guinea? Well, I went to Guinea to find out. I've been based in Senegal, working as a journalist across West Africa, 
and decided luckily before COVID hit hard to jump on a cramped minibus, a sort of what you might call a large maxi taxi, if you will, that had a bundle of luggage that more than doubled its height. It was supposed to hold 15, but we were about 25 in there. I arrived in Conakry in April of 2019 after a trip that had lasted more than 50 hours. I traveled from the barren flats of Senegal, across the mighty river Gambia, then onto a battered road that wound through the forested hills and between the red canyons of Guinea's Futa Jalon Highlands. In Conakry, I spoke to old comrades, old neighbors who became teary-eyed at the mere mention of his name. And I spoke to the wife of Guinea's first president, Sekuture, who received me in Kwame Nkrumah's old Conakry residence. I also looked through Tori's archive in Guinea, which, which revealed everything from party documents to private letters, to the books he read, to his offhand thoughts scribbled on the back of envelopes. What I found was that black power was a way stop on a political evolution that led to Pan-Africanism and to a global revolutionary consciousness. The for a generation, Tory led perhaps the largest Pan-Africanist party of the day, the All-African People's Revolutionary Party. And as he became arguably the foremost supporter of the Palestinians outside the Arab world. He was also involved in local politics and community activism in Guinea. While Stokely Carmichael, as he was then known, while his political career in America may seem to have ended when he boarded a plane for Guinea with his wife, Miriam McCabe in 1969, never to permanently return. If we look at Kwame Ture, the African, we see that he was politically active until he breathed his last. From Black Power to Pan-Africanism. Ture's call for Black Power in 1966 electrified Black communities throughout the US and helped to turn him into public, number, public enemy number one. Earlier that year, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, or SNCC, which he chaired, had denounced the Vietnam War, with Tory popularizing the anti-draft slogan, hell no, we won't go. SNCC had become increasingly influenced by Malcolm X and Franz Fanon, and was undergoing an evolution as they began to link racism on the home front with imperialism abroad the fight for freedom and justice in the United States with the liberation struggles then engulfing Africa and Asia. In Black Power, Touré's 1967 text with Charles V. Hamilton, they'd begun to talk about black ghettos as being internal colonies, a way to link the racism, poverty, and violence of those ghettos to parts of the world then under colonial control. Touré's views on revolutionary affairs were further clarified with a global tour which began in August 1967 and lasted into 1968. This took him to London, where he spoke along, alongside fellow Trinbagonian CLR James, to Cuba, where he was hosted by Castro, to Tanzania, where he was met with, by Walter Rodney and met Julius Nereri, to Vietnam, where he spoke with Ho Chi Minh, and to Syria, where he visited Palestinian refugee camps. Torrey also stopped in Guinea, where he met for the first time President Sekou Toure and Kwame Nkrumah. He was now residing in Conakry, the capital, after having been recently de deposed in a US-supported coup. Despite the setback, Nkrumah, who had led Ghana to independence in 1957, was nonetheless regarded as the high priest of Pan-Africanism. From Vilasili, his seaside residence in Conakry, Nkrumah wrote some of his most influential texts. He also kept abreast of affairs in the US via the BBC World Service each morning, or sometimes by listening to vinyl recordings of speeches by Malcolm X and Stokely Carmichael. I want to hone in on this first meeting between Nkrumah and Carmichael, or Kwame Ture as he later became, because I think it is crucial to understand how Stokely Carmichael, the Trinidadian American black power activist, became Kwame Ture, the African and revolutionary Pan-Africanist. First, this encounter helped to clarify Nkrumah's own thinking when it came to black power. Later that year, in 1968, he published a short essay called The Spectre of Black Power. For Nkrumah, black power was but a precursor to Pan-Africanism. He wrote, emerging from the ghettos, swamps, and cotton fields of America, the spectre of black power has descended on the world like a thundercloud flashing its lightning. The struggle of black power in America or in any other part of the world can only find consummation in the political unification of Africa, the home of the black man and people of African descent 
throughout the world. Second, Nkrumah shared with Toure a draft of the Handbook of Revolutionary Warfare, a book which laid a blueprint for a continent-wide socialist struggle that would lead to a unified continent. The handbook briefly mentions the creation of a continental army and a party, the All African People's Revolutionary Party, which would unify liberated territories under a common ideology to smooth the way for eventual continental unity. After founding a branch of the party in the US, Tory would lead it for the next 30 years. But crucially here, impressed by Tory, Nkrumah and Sekou Tore, the president of Guinea, invited Kwame Tore to live in Guinea on a permanent basis and to work as Nkrumah's secretary. The offer could not have come at a better time. Tore's back had been marked by J. Edgar Hoover's FBI as a potential black messiah who needed to be eliminated. Early in 1969, Tory and his wife, the famed South African singer Miriam Makeba, landed in Guinea. Tory was just 27 years old. I just want to give you a taste of what sort of country Guinea was um, at this time. Um, headed by Ahmed Sekou Tore and his PDG Democratic Party of Guinea, it was largely an isolated country. It had become France's first former colony in West Africa to achieve independence in 1958. Guinea's outspoken and charismatic president had rejected an offer for everything from military affairs, currency, and education to be called, controlled from Paris in exchange for independence, famously angering his French counterpart, Charles de Gaulle, by saying that we would prefer poverty and freedom to riches in slavery. Indeed, when I met her, Hadja Toure, the wife of Secretary, was able to convey some of Charles de Gaulle's facial expression when he heard that from Secretary. But for this disobedience, Guinea was severely punished. Not only did French troops carry off the territory's gold and sabotage institutions on their way out, when Guinea decided to introduce a new currency, France launched a secret operation to flood the country with counterfeit notes, crashing the economy before it had barely stood on its own two feet. The country's precariousness was further underscored by Portuguese invasion in 1970, just a year after Makeba and Tory arrived. Tory and Makeba were forced to drive through Conakry to safety amid fierce firefights. And with this taking place so soon after the arrival, you can really sense this, the sense of struggle that Tory must have been faced with when he arrived in West Africa. Nevertheless, throughout the 1970s from his base in Conakry in Guinea, Tory tried to build the All African People's Revolutionary Party. The party would claim to have recruited members from 33 countries and would have important beachheads in the Caribbean, the US, the UK, and of course, in Africa. In Kruma and Secretore, who himself wrote 26 books throughout his 26 years as head of state of Guinea, were major influences in shaping the party's ideology. The AAPRP advocated for a uniquely African variant of scientific socialism as set up by Nkrumah, who argued that this was a modern day version of communalism, the old African way of social organization. Party ideology differed from Marxism in that it recognized the existence of the spiritual realm as it relates to Africa, accommodating what Nkrumah called the so-called triple heritage, traditional African belief systems, the Islamic heritage and Euro-Christian influences. Members were supposed to be instilled with the traits of the revolutionary African personality, embodying the principles of humanism, egalitarianism, and collectivism. Furthermore, the party also embarked on an ambitious program of education through what they called the work study circle, where party members met each fortnight to discuss a core reading list that included Franz Fanon, Nkrumah, and Marx. Once grounded in theory, Members were then set to organize the masses. As Tory put it, organization is necessary because oppressed people have never defeated their oppressors without it. Few chapters of the AAPRP, if any, were as diverse as the British one. It included Ghanaians, Guyanese, Jamaicans, Nigerians, Sierra Leoneans, South Africans, cultural nationalists to Marxists, political novices straight out of university, to veteran operatives fleeing military dictatorships, PhDs to self-taught mavericks, the working class and the well-off and everything in between. 
But its most influential base was by far in the US, where the party became a constant on university campuses, partly a result of annual lectures by Touré, where he had been estimated to reach 100,000 students between 1970 and 1984. Its most important base was at Howard University, based in the heart of the US capital, Washington, DC. From there, the party set out to influence politicians and the diplomatic community. But it also gave a platform to leaders of the African liberation movement who desperately needed to raise money. Throughout the 1970s and 80s, the party was perhaps the most influential, the largest organization across the African diaspora. But as the party gained ground in the US, it faced challenges in Africa itself. Mobilizing in Guinea was difficult because it was a one-party state under Secretariat's PG, PDG. However, the party had a presence in a number of African countries, including Guinea-Bissau, Sierra Leone as well. And Kwame Touré, as a de facto diplomat, was able to maintain high-level contacts with the liberation movements. While Touré still harbored hopes that the AAPRP might be able to bring together ideologically similar parties across the continent, this was not to be. In Africa, gains made at independence where leaders sought to redistribute wealth, industrialize, eradicate racism, were rolled back with a string of counter coups, assassinations, and neocolonialism. In the 70s, amid the Cold War, newly independent countries such as Angola and Mozambique descended into civil war. A further blow to Kwame Touré's Pan-African journey was the untimely death of his sponsor, Ahmed Sekou Touré, in 1984. As one party member and comrade of Touré, Sekou Mbaki, told me, so we found ourselves only holding the handbook. What Nkrumah was talking about, we could not do it. When I was in Guinea, I came across some documents that showed Touré's involvement in the creation of a women's wing in the party. It is no secret that historically, at least, some Pan-African groups have undermined, underappreciated, and maybe forced women into more menial tasks. From the 1970s onwards, women had begun to agitate, and some even broke away to form their own organizations. Women had begun to push for a greater say in the AAPRP from as early as 1973. And by the end of the decade, the party was starting to articulate a progressive intersectional position that acknowledged that women faced a triple oppression based on class, race, and sex. The documents give us an insight into, into the party's thinking. For instance, there were the results of a questionnaire of 54 party members in the state of Ohio in March 1980, which revealed differing views about the wing. Asked if women have any problems inside the party, one male member wrote, the largest problem is chauvinism and sexist tendencies among African men. Another male member ponders, why at this point in our development is a woman's wing seen as more crucial than a youth wing? One female member writes that men dominate the major projects of the party and are more outspoken and assertive. She adds, women do what is expected to serve the brothers. But a comment made by Touré in 1964 when he was 23 years old, that the best position of women in the movement was prone, has continued to overshadow his own reputation when it comes to women. At the end of a joke-laden speech at a SNCC retreat in 1964, the then 23-year-old Touré turned to the discussion of position papers. What is the position of women in SNCC, he asked rhetorically. The position of women in SNCC is prone, at which point the crowd burst into laughter. I spoke to Muriel Tillingast, who was active alongside Touré from 1960, first at Howard University and then later in SNCC. She said he had a lot of humor. A lot of the times you can't tell the difference between what was humorous versus what was real. But he didn't really mean that. I know he didn't really mean that. She adds, the movement was based on women and I've never known him to be anti-female in his communication or in his interjections. That's that same black power fast mouth, she quipped. But the joke damaged Tory's reputation. However, the correspondence shows that in face of strong opposition from some male members, Touré was determined to push through the AAPRP's Women's Wing, which was eventually founded as the All-Africans Women's Revolutionary Union in October 1980 in Washington, DC. 
Trinbagonian scholar, Professor Carol Boyce Davis at Cornell University has said that its creation was quite significant and more advanced than a lot of other organizations, but that it has not got the credit that, that it deserves. Alliances. Toure was also a consummate alliance builder, channeling most of his efforts through the AAPRP. His support for global freedom struggles is another area that has received very little attention. As we recalled earlier, back in 1966, Toure had become one of the US's foremost anti-Vietnam activists before a global tour the following year saw him meet some of the leading revolutionaries of the day. In 1967, SNCC had provoked a storm when it released a publication that criticized Israel for its conduct in the Six Day War. The backlash against the organization would eventually lead to its collapse, or at least precipitate its collapse. Touré argued that Israel's incursion into Egypt during the war was an invasion of Africa itself and was highly critical of the country's close relationship with apartheid South Africa. From the mid 1960s until the time of his death more than a generation later, Touré claimed to have read at least one book on the Palestinians or on Israeli Zionism per month. Indeed, over the years, Touré would emerge as arguably the most outspoken voice in support of Palestine and the fiercest critic of Israel outside of the Arab world. In 1979, Touré visited Lebanon to meet officials of the Palestinian Liberation Organization kept up a lively correspondence with Afro-Palestinian militant Fatima Binawi, and in early 1990, formed a Pan-African Alliance in Tripoli in support of the Palestinians. The list of AAPRP allies runs into the hundreds. It included Sinn Féin in Ireland, the Workers' Party of Korea, the Polisario Front in Western Sahara, the American Indian Movement, the Black Consciousness Movement of Brazil, the Sandinista Front for National Liberation in Nicaragua, the Hackney Black People's Association in London in the UK, and the Dalit Voice in India. So Tory joins this long list of Pan-Africanists and internationalists to come out of Trinidad and Tobago. There are of, no there are of course no shortage of Pan-Africanist figures from across the Caribbean, from Garvey, Aimé Césaire, Franz Fanon, Suzanne Roussy, Walter Rodney, Sylvie Winter. But it is fair to say that Trinidad and Tobago does seem to punch above its weight here. It is that a country straddling two continents, largely populated by people with origins in three more, Africa, Asia, and Europe, attempts to bring about a world in the image of itself? I do not know. These figures made multiple decisive contributions to black struggle across the world, often at great personal cost. Henry Sylvester Williams organized the first Pan-African conference in London in 1900. CLR James, whose contributions are too many to mention here, but refrained from turning Caribbean historiography on its head via his book, The Black Jacobins, to lasting contributions to British black radicalism and trade unionism in Trinidad and Tobago. George Padmore, who led the Communist International, the 1945 Pan-African Congress in Manchester, and as a mentor to Kwame Nkrumah, Claudia Jones, both in the US and in Britain, where she founded the West Indian Gazette and Trinidadian Style Carnival. The academic, Oliver Cromwell Cox, who has helped us to understand the global workings of what has become known as racial capitalism. John LaRose, the pioneer and publisher and activist, who operated both in Trinidad and Tobago and Britain. And last but not least, visionary Prime Minister Eric Williams, who wrote Capitalism and Slavery. Along with Calypso, the carnival and still plan, such figures might be said to be among Trinidad and Tobago's greatest exports. It would seem only reasonable that figures like Kwame Touré are duly recognized and honored as the heroes they are. So far, I've spoken about Touré on the political stage, his relationship with Nkrumah, his work with the AAPRP, his global solidarity work. But now I want to zoom in a little bit closer and look at what sort of person he was what his character was like. Tori and his wife, Mira McCaber, arrived in Guinea as a sort of celebrity power couple. Tori's public persona contrasted with that of Kwame Nkrumah, who lived a sort of ascetic life, sleeping for no more than four hours, fasting on Fridays, 
and eaten for lunch each day, a soup made out of, made out of palm nuts, snails, and fish, along with fufu, of course. Despite his considerable political experience, Tory was only in his late twenties and still had a lot to learn for his mentor, whom he referred to as old man. But at times Nkrumah felt as though Toure's celebrity overshadowed his politics. I think he is talking too much. He likes the limelight, Nkrumah once wrote. In another missive, he put it, he is capable, but as most youth are, very impulsive. But I think he is reliable. He then added, on the whole, Malcolm X was more mature. Toure recalled cautions against his youthful impetuosity and appears to have accepted them re readily. He was learning that becoming a revolutionary also required inequalities such, such as patience, humility, and selflessness. It would appear that later in life, Tory had maybe absorbed some of Nkrumah's qualities because he worked to spread revolutionary values worldwide. He also worked to instill them in his private life as well. For Tory, the political was the personal. After McCabe divorced him in 1979, later that same year, Tore married Maliatu Barry, a Guinean doctor. Two years later, their son, Boka, the first of Tore's two sons, was born. They disagreed about his upbringing. If Tore had had his way, his son would live a life that was no better than the average Guinean child. He would send him to be raised in his mother's ancestral village. Maliati, on the other hand, wanted the opposite, the best standard of living and the finest education. These two conflicting visions would lead to separation and ultimately divorce. When staying with his mother in Conakry, Boka was subjected to the normative social codes typical of a well-to-do West African family where hierarchy mattered. But when he went to see his father, he was suddenly forced to treat everyone as equals. Boka recalled a time his dad scolded him after he failed to address his mother's chauffeur as uncle and instead used the man's first name. Maliatu managed to get her away and got Boka into a leading private front school. Tori was forced to grudgingly accept, but he laid down one condition, that Boka would take the popular buses with the other state school children, something that was considered shocking in Guinea's class conscious society. As Boka told me, he wanted me to be of the masses and have absolutely no privilege. His politics were intertwined with his character. After Sekou Toure's death in 1984, Kwame Toure lost his government-sponsored accommodation and political status and came to live in Konakri's leafy Rotoma neighborhood. I visited Rotoma and went inside two of the houses he stayed in and spoke to his old neighbors. Tieno Jallo, one of the boys who grew up in the neighborhood, told me that Tori's house acted almost as a community center and that he kept an open door policy. Each day, 20 to 30 children could be seen playing, pitching marbles or fighting on the concrete driveway. Tori would be seated at the far end under the porch, almost always bare chested with a sarong wrapped around his waist, reading or giving math lessons to the children, many of whom thought, Boka told me, his job was to read. However, the inside of the house was Spartan. Boko told me that his father got rid of a fridge bought by his mother because he had a strong belief in sharing other Africans suffering. If he had one extra pair of underwear, he would give it to somebody else. Tori now woke up, Tori now woke up early each day. He would tune into BBC World Service and then have breakfast. He would then read for a few hours. After that, he would drive to the post office in central Conakry. His work with the AAPRP meant that he was in constant contact with party members across the world. Afternoons were spent at political meetings and embassies. He was a regular to the Cuban, Ghanaian, North Korean and Palestinian embassies. It was not uncommon for Tori to have lunch there before returning back to Rotoma. But it was also his custom to eat with his neighbor, Kapuro, the local chief. Sitting outside the compound, cooking over coals, one of Kapura's wives smiled at me as she remembered how much she used to love her white rice topped with avocado. Almost tearing up, she recalled that whenever he traveled, he would come back with plenty of gifts to give to his children. 
Additionally, each Sunday without fail, Tori took the neighborhood children to the beach and he showed them how to swim. As one child, Tieno, mentioned before, said, he taught me how to swim. He would hold my body on the water and tell me what to do. I just want to make now some concluding remarks. So how do we assess Kwame Ture's legacy, right? I think the only measure in his success by whether he attained his political goals would be to miss the point. Ture saw the revolutionary struggle as an eternal one and to measure it by the short-term standards we apply to sitting prime ministers or presidents doesn't get us very far. He helped to grow the All African People's Revolutionary Party into one of the largest such organizations in the 70s and 80s. He also took on the mantle of Pan-Africanism at a time when the movement was splintering and operating from Guinea, he became an important advocate for the cause of African unity. Tori once wrote, I quote, in the liberation struggles of Africans and all oppressed and exploited peoples, some unfolding over generations, even centuries. There are low points and reverses. That's all, the struggle continues. I think that the force of his personality, generosity, sincerity and charisma meant that he was able to inspire a whole generation of Pan-Africanists. I'm struck by how many people have commentary stories wherever I go. People across the African continent, in Mali, Gambia, the Senegal, I once met the family of a Baha'i leader who had stories about Kwame Ture, people throughout the Caribbean, in Britain and in the US as well. And in recent years, there seems to have been a renewed interest in Ture in a world that seems more fragmented than ever. Scholars like Chris Martinez at UCLA look set to open a new chapter in the study of Kwame Ture. Ture's activism, which set out to challenge white supremacy and imperialism transnationally speaks somewhat to the current political moment. The Emancipation Support Committee, I think has done a wonderful job at keeping Kwame Ture's memory alive in Trinidad and Tobago, both in honoring him during his homecoming in 1966 and today with the launch of the Kwame Ture lecture series. Work still needs to be done, however. And Ture's legacy in years to come will in large part depend on how we as a country choose to commemorate him today. Thank you very much for listening. So Dr. Fergus, I believe you're muted. Oh, sorry, sorry. I, 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 I was muted there because I was trying to resolve a problem uh, with uh, the communication with the, our technical team, I'm sorry. Okay, so I want to thank um, Brother Amanda for a very powerful lecture for tying all these very intricate knots in the life of uh, Kwame Ture uh, from uh, his very early revolutionary activities right down to the end of his life. Uh, to the audience on Facebook and YouTube, we are going to take your questions. And uh, of course you can 
continue texting. We will uh, address as many as we can uh, till the end of the time allocated to us. Uh, but in the meantime, I have two questions here. I have one from the audience. So, but um, Amanda, I have two questions, one from myself. I'm curious about this. And then I would give you the one for the audience. Um, what role did Kwame Ture play in the formation of the all African People's Revolutionary uh, uh, Party, first of all, and the all African People's Revolutionary Army? But particularly, I'm particularly curious about whether his role, if he had any key role in any of those movements, but particularly the army, how did that impact on his relationship with the United States government or even other Caribbean governments? And from the audience, there's a question here. Is there any contemporary Pan-Africanists worth mentioning. So we would start with those two for now. Sure. The last um, session um, of the party took place actually, um, I believe in Kwame Nkrumah's house in Conakry. Um, so it first started with what I said is a work study circle. So this is a, a group where um, you meet to study a text and, you know, you sort of come back the week, the following week, having read um, some of the passages and you sort of discuss it. So the first session, I believe, was held in Akuma's residence in Conakry around 1968, if I'm, if I'm correct. And uh, Kwame Ture um, was, was present. Now, um, when Kwame Ture went back to the US, he founded a branch of the party um, in the US. And um, as I mentioned, um, that branch kind of overshadowed maybe the other branches, um, you, know, uh, you know, of the party across the world, um, but was nonetheless um, an important player on, on university campuses. Um, and, and, and the party obviously expanded in Trinidad and Tobago, there was a presence in, in the UK, um, other parts of Africa, even in, I, I've heard in Central America. Um, and so, you know, by the sort of late 70s going into the 80s, it was perhaps the largest um, Pan-African uh, sort of party um, across the African um, diaspora, I can say. Yeah. Um, in terms of the in terms of the second question, um, it's, it's, I mean, it's an interesting, interesting, important, in, in, important question. Um, important Pan-Africanists today. I mean, I think, I think, I, I think, I think, in some ways, Pan-African. If we, if I, if I could put it this way, that the sort of the heroic or the classical period of, or, you know, Pan-Africanism, um, I, I, I would say has ended for now, right? Um, you, know, you know, there are certain figures, um, Kwame Ture being one of them, Kwame Nkrumah, um, who, who very much spoke to a particular, um, a particular moment. Um, it, was, it was a time of particular possibilities um, where the world was structured I mean, in such a way, there was you know, independence movements. Um, obviously, you know, it, you know, it was a Cold War um, as well, um, and they really spoke to that moment. I think one of the issues we have now with Pan Africanism is that it's used to refer to a, a wide number um, of you know various movements. Um, some of them, uh, you know, maybe more radical than radical than others. Um, we have, you know, sort of companies or multinational corporations adopting um, Pan-Africanism um, and using it, um, you know, for their own ends. Um, and so personally, in, in my sort of studies on Pan-Africanism, I've tended to, to focus on people like Kwame Ture, Malcolm X, um, Nkrumah, um, so on and so forth. Um, there are other important um, scholars, you know, of the African diaspora um, that, that I think are important today. People like Sylvia Winter, people like Professor Carol Boyce Davis, um, who I mentioned as well, um, and you know these can help help us to sort of tie tie the different parts of the diaspora together in how we sort of move forward. Um, but I, I do I do think it's it's very difficult um, for me to sort of just you know f f throw off a few names a, a few names 
um, today when I think that uh, people of those of bygone years are so compelling. Yeah, I have a question here. Apparently, it's a follow up to the previous one. Is there any more information available uh, on the double APRP, the, Rev the Revolutionary Party who died, the member, on the member who died? I'm. I'm. I'm not. I'm. I'm not. I'm not aware of that. Could you, could you please give 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 a little bit more information? about the question. Well, I am not too clear myself, but the question is, is there any more information on the sponsor of the uh, revolutionary party who died? I'm, I'm not sure how to answer that. I'm not, I'm not aware that there was someone who died in connection with the party, um, but I'm, I'm, I'll be happy to hear some more information and I could, I could address it later on if you're able. Okay. Well, I'm not seeing any more questions at this time. But could you explore a little bit more about the Palestinian um, connection? Uh, why did Toure decide to extend his struggle to the Palestinians? Yeah, yeah. So, um, as mentioned before, I think, you know, there was a sort of an evolution taking place within the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee um, in terms of um, their politics. They were becoming a lot more international um, and they were starting to link um, their struggles um, with other struggles um, abroad. And, and you know, by the time Tory had, had made his call for black power, um, SNCC had already started to, you know, talk about Vietnam um, as being an important struggle. Now, it's important to realize that you know, being based in the United States, um, in some ways, um, SNCC saw its battle, um, you know, as one effectively against um, United States government, right? You know, so it was, it was, it was, it was, it was, you know, sort of its, its militancy was di directed from within the United States, and it also saw those those powers or those places of influence around the world where the US was either supporting regimes or maybe it was engaging in warfare um, as places that it could also draw connections with. And the Palestinians obviously fell into that category because um, the United States was a, uh, an important sponsor um, of, of Israel. And so that's, that, that's the sort of political, ideological, um, you know, sort of reasons for it. I also believe that we can look at a, a connection with Franz Fanon as well, um, who obviously the Rector of the Earth was writing um, about Algeria. He actually finished Wretch of the Earth in, in Ghana, actually, um, as his life was ebbing away. But um, it also talked about, um, you know, here was Franz Fanon, a Caribbean person, Martinican person in Algeria, right? Um, you know, in, you know, in, in, you know in, in a North African country. Um, and I think that that would have had a bearing on how Toure um, sort of thought about the Palestinians and, 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 and thought about struggle um, as well. And another interesting um, part to this um, is that Tory had had actually really been influenced by um, what was, you know, a very important um, sort of black Jewish culture, actually, black spoke Jewish culture um, in New York. Um, there'd been alliances between, you know, black groups and Jews in New York for, for many years. And, and Tory, having grown up in New York, um, was, in, was, was inspired by this and, and was actually at, at one point um, he would say a sort of pro-Zionist or someone who had sympathies um, with Zionism. So his sort of move um, towards support for the Palestinians was actually part of a sort of political evolution um, that sort of took place as he became more radicalized um, about the world is. And, 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 he, and he sort of makes the point um, that, you know, there was a great deal of sort of propaganda um, about what was taking place in the Middle East that he had to sort of get through before you could understand um, really what was actually taking place. Sorry. So Dr. Fergus, you're muted. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Yes. Uh, the question is coming from the audience. Very impressive presentation. Three-part question. 
Can you expand on the movement from Black power to Pan-Africanism? Did Kwame Ture see limitations in Black power? And the third part, how, from his perspective, did Pan-Africanism improve on the Black power? Yeah, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for the question. Um, I would say that when, when Nkrumah um, wrote The Spectre of Black Power, and, and Nkrumah was, was quite clear that Black Power is a precursor to Pan-Africanism, this, this really was Kwame Ture's cue to sort of say that Black Power needs an upgrade effectively, right? And I think the important distinction is in the breadth of, of the politics effectively. You know, Black Power is very much um, sort of called within the US context, and Pan-African is looking at things in a, in, in a sort of broader sense. But crucially, crucially with Pan-Africanism, and this is, this is really at the heart of it, the unification of Africa is central to Pan-Africanism, right? That, that, is, that, that, that is really the central, the central sort of point. And this was a point that Nkrumah, um, when Ghana became independent in 57, he said that, you know, our liberation is not complete until the, the entire unification of Africa is, you know, is, is also completed as well. So I think there's a centering of, of, Af of, of, of Africa um, when it comes to Pan-Africanism. And, you know, as we know, Pan-Africanism has a sort of, you know, a, a broader sort of, um, you know, trajectory um, than Black Power. And we can, you know, we can take it back to, you know, Henry, Henry Sylvester Williams, and we can go even further back, I mean, to the 19th century, even further back than that. Um, so I think, I think Black Power was, a, was an entry point, basically, um, you know, for, for the sort of, militancy in the United States, black militancy in the United States to join a much wider um, sort of struggle. Um, that, that's at least how I saw it. Um, and and I, I, don't, I don't think that, you know, I mean, in some ways the two are interchangeable to, you know, to a certain extent as well. Um, Pan-African, black power is included within Pan-Africanism um, as well. Yeah. Okay, we have another question here. Please speak on the intersection between scientific socialism Mm. and the traditional African system, such as Mahat? Sure. So I think, I think with scientific socialism, as sort of described by Nkrumah, or as the AAPRP um, would have it, it's not a, a strictly sort of material um, sort of socialism, right? Um, there is an aspect where, where the spiritual or the traditional um, is also taken into taken into consideration, right? This this idea Nkrumah had of the, the revolutionary African personality, um, yes, as someone who is revolutionary and someone who is you know, you know has values of you know of you know equality and and and, and you know is generous and 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 is not greedy and everything. But there are also um, traditional African values um, that are also um, enshrined in that. So I think I think that's where the intersection lies. But I would, I mean, I would, I, I would, I would say that, you know, Nkrumah kind of, I guess, you know, Nkrumah is interesting because I think, I think there's a journey if you look at his sort of, you know, trajectory, right? Um, he's obviously greatly influenced by George Padmore and, and you know, and C.L.R. James. Um, and then he takes power in Ghana and he has that experience of taking power in Ghana. Um, and then he's sort of in exile in Guinea afterwards. And he does a great deal of writing um, while in, um, exile in Guinea. And one of one of the key texts he writes um, is conscientiousism. My my pronunciation is not always great. And and in, and and it's really in that book that he elaborates about the importance of traditional African systems um, within any conception um, of society. That it cannot just be a purely sort of material, a materialist um, sort of philosophy um, as well. Okay, if I may add an addendum to that question, sure. Uh, I think there was an issue between. And Kuma and Padmore, that led to a sort of a riff because they shared different ideas on socialism and the Pan Africanism. Sure. Uh, Padmore believed that the two were becoming, or he had, in fact, come to the realization that they were incompatible. Sure. Uh, but um, Nkuma saw no issue with them at all. Could you elaborate on that from, for us, please? Yeah, yeah. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I mean, you know, like, like Nkuma, Padma also um, was sort of on a journey, so to speak. Um, you know, he had, you know, Padma was living in Moscow, 
at one point, which you know, in the you know the 1920s, and and was a sort of um, a member of the Communist Party of the USA and radical journalist. Um, and and yeah, the, 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 there is there is a point in Padmore's um, sort of trajectory um, where he sort of he, it seems as though he's moving in in in, in a different direction from Nkrumah, effectively, right? Um, and 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 there is that is that sort of there is that sort of rift. Um, I mean, I think you know, you know, you know, who, you know, who, you know, it's it's hard for me to adjudicate as to you know who is right and who is wrong, <laughs> um, you know, on, on these matters because I think I think there, I, I I guess they're quite theoretical matters, um, so to speak. Um, and Kruma, I think one of one of the things interesting about Nkrumah was that he was he was a great synthesizer. Um, he kind of wanted to have his cake and eat it, like he wanted to have everything um, sort of there, um, and you know, Nkrumah has come into criticism from, you know, you know, from Marxists, Marxist, for example, or Marxist Leninists, for example, um, for maybe being a bit sort of um, a, a bit wet, maybe when it comes to um, issues to do with spirituality. Um, but he's also come come under attack from the other side as well, um, which which of course is also understandable. Um, and I think I, I think we also have to understand the times as well that. You know, this this was a moment in time where, you know, most of the leading figures in Pan Africanism were heavily steeped in European philosophy um, and thought, or Eurocentric philosophy and thought, and they were trying to apply or stretch these concepts, you know, to Africa um, and so on and so forth, right? Um, so you know, I, I want you know, I wonder, you know, if there was an Nkrumah today, you know, you know, what would he think? Um, I think I think he would probably think about things very differently, but. But I think we have to accept that um, these were the times that you know that, that they were living in, um, and I think things would be very different now um, if we were to think about Pan Africanism today. Well, that's a great way to end that uh, uh, that answer because it leads to the next question from the audience: What is the greatest impediment in the path of Pan Africanism in the twenty first century? Yeah. Um, One of one of the interesting things that I I realized living here in Senegal, okay, I mean I, I can I can say a few things. So, I, I I've you know tended to when I travel I tend to go to countries which were once part of the British Empire, right? You know, I was born in London and uh, you know I mean United States, but you know, Trinidad and Tobago, Saint Vincent, you know, um, and it was only later in life I started to go to countries that were part of other empires. So like I went to Martinique, I went to Puerto Rico, I went to um, obviously, I went to Senegal, and uh, while living in Senegal, um, I was covering um, predominantly francophone countries um, in the region. Now, this was a bit of an eye-opener for me, because as far, as far as I was concerned, or as far as many of us maybe were concerned, is that um, coming from the UK, Africa, West Africa consisted of maybe two, if not, maybe, maybe up to four countries. There was Nigeria, there was Ghana. And there was, to a lesser extent, maybe Liberia, the Gambia, and and and, and sort of Sierra Leone, right? Um, and then when I came here, everything was kind of was kind of shifted. Like, you know, the UK was no longer important. Nigeria wasn't really an issue. It was about Mali. It was about Senegal. It was Burkina Faso. It was, you know. And what I realized really is that we operate in separate sort of linguistic cultural zones, effectively, right? Um, our our geographies, our thinking. Um, within one part of the world, or, the, or, or a single part of the world, can be radically different depending on what language, we, depending on what, what language we speak. People are often surprised to hear that English is only spoken by about, like, as a first language, by fifteen percent of people in the Caribbean, right? You know, um, you know. So, so I think I think that's an impediment that we haven't overcome some of the linguistic barriers, um, but also the way that. The legacy of colonialism creates these sort of, I mean, helps to perpetuate these barriers still, still today. You know, we, you know, you know, we read the news, we hear about certain countries, we don't know what's going on elsewhere. We also have to contend with um, the fact that the nationalism, I think, is a, is a big deal. Um, there, there was a moment last year where there were a number of sort of, you know, uprisings or sort of unrest in, in, in a number of African countries. You know, there was, there was Senegal, um, we had NSARS in Nigeria. Um, in, in Uganda, there was, you know, there was a, a sort of a clampdown on sort of Bobby Wine, 
um, he was he was sort of um, you know running for um, for president against um, Museveni. Um, and I was sort of looking at this and, and and just sort of seeing the like there just seemed to be very little um, sort of interaction from what I could see from what you know where I stand interaction between these different movements, right? Um, and it seemed as though people were only triggered by what was local um, to them, right? Um, and that I, I found I found that really interesting. Even though um, here in Senegal there was a you know there was a small ceremony for um, when George Floyd was you know you know you know was you know, was assassinated was killed. There, there, you know there was a ceremony here, um, but why not for what happens in Mali? Why not for what happens in you know in another country? Um, and I think you know the nation state has 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 perpetuated um, the sort of divisions, our sort of ideological, our conceptual divisions. Um, of kind of who we are and, and, and how we're connected with one another. Um, and I think we have to find ways to, to kind of work around that, um, you know, in terms of our education, in terms of, um, you know, how we relate to one another as well. I, I hope that helps answer your question. Sure. We'll come back to that in a while. But let me take the next question from the audience. Um, this person apologizes for coming in a bit late and probably addressing what you might have addressed. But I think that sometimes reiteration is a good method of learning, you know? So uh, the question is, what might have happened had Toure not been banned by Williams? Do you think he would have returned to Trinidad and Tobago? Um, it's a good question. It's a, it's a very good question. Um, I don't think he would have permanently returned to Trinidad and Tobago. I, I, I don't think he would have. Um, so I, I, I mentioned that um, there was talk um, within the British Embassy, or the British High Commission, I should say, in Port of Spain, um, during the time of the 1970 Black Power Revolt. And the rumor going around was that, um, you know, the leaders, you know, NJAC and you know, other leaders were gonna topple Williams and, and, and basically, um, you know, anoint Tory as you know as a sort of you know as a new leader, basically. Um, now, I I wrote a piece for Newsday to Nan Tobago about about um, and I mentioned this this point and um, uh, Shabaka Kambon uh, kindly asked his father about this and said that there was no you know there was no talk there was no um, talk about having Tory um, you know sort of um, sat on the throne. Um, so there was a lot of rumors going around, and you know as we know. Um, you know, some of these rumors may have even been sort of manufactured, who knows. Um, so I guess what I'm trying to say is that Toure was, was perhaps not the threat um, that the British or even Williams maybe thought that he was. Um, I don't think that there was any sort of plan for him to come back and to, you know, to take over or, I don't know, something like that. I, 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 I don't think so. I think, I, I think he really wanted to be on the African continent. Um, I think that was I think that was really important for him. Um, he had he, you know he'd really been influenced um, by Nkrumah, and I think he was really committed um, to ensuring um, you know African unity and um, you know as much as possible. And, and I think going going to Africa was a sort of you know a, you know a sort of return home. Um, I did I did mention I, and I don't I don't wish to um, you know sort of make this controversial, but but Tory. Tory I, I've said this to people, and I said, you know, you know, you know, Kwame Ture was, a, you know, a Trinbegonian. They say, no, he was not a Trinbegonian. He was an African, right? So he he didn't he didn't define himself um, by by his national identity, right? He defined himself as an African. Um, and 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 when you when you meet people from when I've met people from rural African people's revolutionary party, they'll say that I'm an African born in Haiti. I'm an African born in Britain. I'm an African born in whatever. But, but the African identity is really paramount and and supersedes um, and become and comes before. Um, the national identification. Okay, I have a question here that says just what about Padmore? I want to presume that the person is asking about the relationship between Padmore and uh, Kwame Ture. So I want to add to that my own um, input into that you and join with that uh, questioner. Was there any connection between Ture and Maurice Bishop, seeing that Bishop had launched what was effectively the first Black Power government to come out of the Black Power movement. Was there any 
uh, communication or relationship between the two. So those two, Padma yeah. and uh, Bishop. On the first question, um, I would prefer not to not to comment more because I simply don't don't know much more about it. If I'm if I'm to be perfectly honest, um, on the second, it's an interesting question and it's something that I've actually asked um, some of the people involved in the Grenada Revolution. Um, my my dissertation project at Cornell actually is is about Grenada. Um, I'm sort of you know very early stages, but I have been interested in 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 the Grenada Revolution for a few years now. And um, I, I'd asked um, Selwyn Strawn, um, he was, uh, he participated in the revolution. He was a minister, I think, of, of labor at one point, a minister of, for want of a better term, propaganda, I think, uh, you know, at another point. Um, and he was um, residing in London. I went to see him and I said to him, you know, Kwame Ture, you know, was, was there any, any influence? He, he said that actually, um, to my surprise, um, that there wasn't, there wasn't much of a sort of an influence actually during the time of the revolution. What he did, what he did say, interestingly though, was Strawn, um, he was, um, had, gone to, had gone to Canada basically um, for, uh, for a conference um, and he had met Kwame Ture there in Canada. And Kwame Ture spoke about the importance of organization, 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 organization. And Strawn said that this had a, had a massive impact on how we thought about organizing Grenada as, as, as a revolutionary, um, you know, sort of state. Um, so there was that ideological influence um, from Turing. When the revolution um, imploded, um, I believe that, and I, I might, I need to check my notes, that Turing may have visited Grenada um, um, in support of, um, and this was after Moise Bishop had, you know, had, you know, had sadly been, been assassinated. Um, the, the Tory vi visited um, sort of Grenada um, and, and sort of met with um, some of bishops, um, you know, sort of comrades, um, and so on and so forth. Um, I believe I need to maybe check that. So, so I'm happy to follow up with that um, if if that's okay. Um, but but I think I think it's I think it's a great question. And um, you know, Tory really at that time is at the you know is at the top of his game in terms of, of his pan Africanism. So you would have expected a bit more of an influence on the revolution. Perhaps there, you know perhaps there is more. Um, that I haven't been able to, you know, to, you know, to find out. Um, but yeah, thank you for that question. Yeah, question from the audience. Kwame Ture was a true visionary and teacher, but can you speak to whether his consistent communication, advocacy, and uh, teachings were taken up by African governments mm -hmm. or African leadership at the time? Or was he viewed as more of a moral conscience who reminded our people of the truth within the struggle? I mean, I mean, it's a, I mean, it's a, it's a great question once again. Um, <clears throat> I think, I think that you know, Kwame Ture is operating um, at a time where you know the rug is slipping from beneath his feet, effectively, right? I mean. The global pan-African movement, the global black, black, black power movement, um, is really in recession, right? Um, and um, governments are not becoming more pan-African; they're becoming less pan-African. You know, you know, if anything, right? Uh, the, the the Soviet Union, which I guess um, you know was an alternative, um, a promising alternative, you know, a sort of alternative world, um, is also collapsing at the same time. So, throughout the eighties. You have these periods, right? 60s, 70s, you have counter coups. Um, you have 60s, you have assassinations taking place. By the 80s, you have a lot of structural adjustments, right? So you have the onset of neoliberalism, effectively, right? Um, and, you know, governments are, are told to restructure their economies in ways um, that are the complete opposite on the sort of wealth distribution um, economics that maybe some of them would have wanted in the first place. Um, there is austerity. Um, you know, there's changes to, you know, to, you know, to production. Um, and so um, the, the, the sort of, you know, policies, economics um, that Tory is talking about um, isn't really, you know, sort of taken up from as, from as far as I can tell. Well, um, I, when I was in Guinea, I spoke to um, the minister um, of mining. Guinea is the sec world's second largest, if, if not the largest producer of bauxite um, in the world. So obviously someone who 
he kind of knows what he's talking about. Um, and, he, and it was interesting because he actually, um, uh, he was one of the children who used to run around at Tori's feet, basically, you know, in, you know, in Rotoma. And he, you know, he knew Tori very well. Um, um, and, and, and there was a point in the interview where he sort of said that, you know, I deeply respected the love that he had for African people. But where I part ways with him is over his prescriptions as to how to develop um, Africa, you know? So he was sort of saying that, like, you know, his way or the, or the way, I, I guess, of the government, contemporary government, um, was very much different um, and, and, and is very much different um, from the path that Toure um, had been advocating. Um, but but there, is, there, there is something, I guess, sort of um, almost timeless, or at least I think Toure saw revolutionary Pan-Africanism as something kind of timeless. Um, the, there's a point um, in, my, in my text, and I'll, I'll just read out the quote from Toure's son, um, and he, he basically says to me, he says, um, uh, so the world is changing, but he's still holding onto a political line. In the 90s, he's a last of the Mohicans type figure. For some people, it's like this man never sells out. He always sticks. But to other people, the world has sort of changed and you also need to change along with it, right? Um, so so Toru was very much principled, um, stuck to his guns um, about how the world should be, even though the world had completely transformed, um, been transformed by the end of his life. Yeah. Okay, this one, uh, before going on to the next question, I would read this response from the audience. I am sure Bishop was in contact with Turi and the AAPRP, that's for those who don't know, the All African People's Revolutionary Party. Having spoken at African Liberation Day in DC, Mm -hmm. uh, also, Kwame had served, Kwame had several of his co-members attend ALD in Grenada and the mm -hmm. Women's Convention. I was one of them. Well, not me. That's, <laughs> the, that's so, from the you. audience, right? Yeah. Thank, thank you very much. And, and uh, I, I, would love, I would love to talk about this more. I'm, I'm, really, I'm really grateful for that contribution. I would love to talk about this more if, if you would like to reveal your identity. <laughs> right, so that's an invitation to the person who posted this comment that uh, you can uh, make arrangements to get in touch with Brother Amanda. He would like to have a conversation with you. Right, so the next question <laughs> from the audience. Given the current domination of global capitalism on world economics, it's a question in three parts. One, is it necessary for Pan-Africanism to consider its economic structure? Two, is it a matter of a greater need for mass education? And the third part, if the latter, given the reality of the control of capitalism over big media and the world education systems. What vehicle would you yeah. recommend that Pan-Africanism utilize to engage the transformation of the mass consciousness towards the benefits of revolutionary communism as a socio-economic something? The rest of the question didn't come yeah. through to me. But I'm, I'm sure you get the Sure. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Thank, thank you again for that question. Um, I think uh, essentially, um, you know, it, it is a large part of it is a problem of economics. Um, the way the world economy is structured and 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 sort of, um, you know, African um, sort of economies um, still sort of their place within it is to sort of provide like sort of, you know, raw materials um, and, and not much besides. Um, so it's, economics is important and, and economics um, is, is, you know, is always, is, is always connected to education and to, you know, and to culture as well. And, um, you know, our systems of education, um, you know, don't do anything to sort of question um, these economic structures. So I think, I think the economic question has to come up and has to be looked at, um, um, I mean, you know, at the heart of it. Um, I think, you know, one way, one way to look at this and, you know, some thinkers are, 
um, are starting to talk about this is, um, you know, can we look at a future which is reparatory, right? Um, that, you know, these, you know, it, it's not by mistake that um, the Africa, Africa's economy is structured um, in the way, you know, in the way it is, you know? Um, primary resources from, from, you know, you know, from our ancestors, you know, as, you know, has always been, um, has always been coveted, um, you know, by European uh, powers, right? Um, and as we know in the Caribbean, um, uh, that, you know, our underdevelopment, um, you know, is also, um, you know, you know, being affected um, by that as well. Um, and so, you know, there's, you know, there's a, a sort of a snowboarding discussion. Um, there's, a, there's a recent book by Oduwa Femi Taiwo, who's um, a scholar, a philosopher at um, Georgetown University, um, who is sort of arguing really that we have to take a, like a global approach, a, a global approach to reparations, right? Um, uh, you know, not just for justice reasons, but also for the fact that actually we're on the, you know, we're, we're on the cusp of environmental catastrophe, something that we feel acutely um, in the Caribbean and, and even here in Dakar. I mean, the, Dakar is, is becoming like a desert almost sometimes. You, you, I mean, you, 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 you know, you're sort of wondering if, it, if, it's, if, if we're near the Sahara. Um, it gets drier and drier um, every time I come. Um, so, so yeah, e economics is, 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 is really central um, to, how we, you know, to how we see things. But we have to take like an approach that looks at economics um, historically um, and not as something that is the outcome of just, you know, contemporary forces. Okay, this is a question, very simple question. Why exactly was Kwame Ture exiled from this country? Okay. Come to um, that and say go. So um, my my reading my reading of it, if I if I if I got this. Um, so Kwame Ture was um, in 1967. Kwame Ture went to went to Britain, um, and he spoke at what was called the Dialectics of Liberation Conference. And you know there was a lot of sort of fanfare, a lot of media attention. Um, in effect, he started. He actually kicked off the Black Power movement in Britain, which is um, quite a significant um, sort of legacy achievement. Um, but the British government decided that he was no conducive to the public goods, um, as we said many times since, and banned him basically. Um, they asked him to leave. And um, I believe Eric Williams um, extended um, this ban. Um, to Trinidad and Tobago, the the, the, the ban the ban I believe, and and again I need to maybe just double check this may have been for, for the entire Commonwealth, um, and and Trinidad and Tobago being part of the Commonwealth, um, you know, Williams had the um, the discretion um, to you know to enforce that, and I think he did, um, and 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 obviously the ban came um, sort of at the height of the Black Power. Um, Revolution in Trinidad and Tobago uh, as well. That the Tory was sort of seen as as influencing or, or you know, you know somehow I'm um, involved in um, as well. It's it, um it, it's also interesting because just to give you an idea of how isolated Tory was. So um, there was a, there was a point where Tory was being um, pursued by um, American secret services. He was also um, it is said <laughs> being pursued. Um, by by the Soviets, right? He was at one point um, banned from entering countries um, that were sort of former former French colonies, effectively, right? He was banned from the he was banned from the he was banned from from the Commonwealth. He, he was ejected from a number of countries as well, um, right? So um, again, this I, I say this to illustrate, um, you know, why Guinea was so important a place for him to live in. Um, because his, I mean, his options were, you know, were kind of limited. Actually, I mean, he, I mean, he couldn't re return home to the country of his birth. I mean, it's, I mean, it's ludicrous, but, but he couldn't. But he, but he could go to the United States, which is, which is interesting, um, and 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 able to sort of um, kickstart this um, this party um, into into the force that it became. Thank you for the question. Sorry, Dr. Claudius, you're you're muted. Dr. Fergus, you're muted. You can unmute I, it's not saying muted. I, I'm having problems with the with the feed. I don't know what's going on there.
We can we can hear you now. You can hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, I don't know what's going on. Right, so um, you mentioned uh, to Ture in, in Britain. Could you elaborate what impact Ture had on the ongoing Black consciousness movement in, in Britain? Mm. And, and um, also um, with respect to the, the Black Panther dimension of the Black power movement. Sure, sure. I, th I, think, that's, I think that's important. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So um, when when Toure um, uh, went, he went to Britain in '67, I believe, um, and uh, he was he, he sort of toured the country, um, sort of BBC sort of following on his coattails, and he he actually met some um, some sort of body and black power activists, effectively um, in in and um, around London. Um, now I know that um, Obi Egbuna, um, he was he was he was a Nigerian, um, and uh, you know, a, and he was studied in the U.S. Um, as well at Howard University. Um, he really kicked off um, by founding um, you know one of the sort of first Black Power movements um, in the U.K. But he was also he also joined um, the British Black Panthers basically, which was founded in 1968, so the year after um, Toure was there. Um, and what's interesting about the British Black Panthers is that when the Black Panther movement is founded in the US, um, you start to see replica movements, replica or movements which, you know, inspired by the Black Panthers um, spread throughout the world. You have Black Panthers um, in, in you, you, I mean, you have the Dalit Panthers, right, in, um, in India. Um, you have the British Black Panthers. Um, you have Black Panther movements, I think, as far forward as New Zealand. Um, you have, there's even one in Israel representing, um, you know, sort of um, Sephardi or Mizrahi um, Jews. Um, so it really spreads around the world. And, and in Britain, um, a movement is founded. And, 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 you know, interestingly enough, that movement is populated with Trinidad and Tobagonians, right? You know, people like um, Darkus Howe, um, you know, you know, some of the key, um, some of the key, key movements and Althea, um, Jones Lacan and Eddie Lacan. Um, are some of the key movements and that key people in that movement, um, which has been immortalized um, for those interested in um, Steve McQueen's um, Small Axe um, series, which you can uh, which you can watch. Um, but 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 Victoria is really seen as catalyzing um, um, that movement um, in Britain, and in in Britain, um, what you start to see is. Um, there's re there really is a, a, I mean, effectively, is a sort of a backlash, basically, by by the Buddhist state to shut down um, these movements, basically, um, and 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 you really start to see, I would say, the sort of beginnings um, of a sort of militancy in, in in UK activism, which which continues really up until today, um, um, in fact, yeah. Uh, that's an addendum to that same thing. Um, as you mentioned, the aggression of the British government. Uh, would you say that there's some connection between um, that reaction to Black Panthers and uh, the policy that was initiated by Powell, I think, um, to send mm -hmm. enough power to send yeah. Particularly black people in the Caribbean back home, I think, with about 900 pounds in their pocket or something like that, and never to come back yeah. to Britain. Because well, they accepted they were never to come back to Britain. Sure. Was there a connection well, there? Yeah, I mean, I think power, I mean, you know, power and powerlism, um, you know, as it's, as it's sort of as it's sort of called, you know, this, this speech by a conservative politician in 1968, which was sort of arguing that, you know, you know, Immigration basically is 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 effectively an invasion of of Britain, right? And and the black man will soon have the whip hand over the white man, right? This was kind of Powell's sort of philosophy, and and I think I think what's what, what's powerful about power is that it, it it creates a sort of a sort of grievance um, that you can then use. It, you, you sort of see power sort of powerism sort of like repeating itself down down the ages, right? You know, um, and and it's effectively like a far right, um, you know, sort of ideology that, that that sort of was brought into the heart of the heart of government, really, and and we still see it even today. Um, I, I would I would say though that 
Britain wanted <laughs> Britain wanted um, Caribbean um, migrants. Can I call them migrants? Because I mean, they were effectively British subjects at the time when the Windrush took place from 1948 onwards. Britain wanted them out, like almost almost right away. Um, in 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 48, the Atlee government um, basically um, uh, sort of regularized citizenship across across the empire, right? Um, and so 680 million or whatever it was people um, now had effectively the right to come to Britain, and Caribbean people, you know, obviously took up um, took that up. But what you see, what you see, if you look at some of the, the you know, the sort of documentation correspondence within um, the civil service, they had no idea that this was going to happen, right? And so straight away, they start to find ways um, to stop more people from coming. And the ways they do that is to actually start to pass immigration acts, basically, um, which limit the numbers um, that are allowed um, to come to Britain. So the British government was thinking about limiting um, immigration from, um, from the Caribbean almost as soon as, you know, who was it? Um, Lord Kitchener was on Tilbury Docks um, talking about London is a place for me. And at, at that point, they're already thinking about it, right? You know, so so yeah, um, yeah. Right to the audience, we would be winding down shortly. So if you have any questions, please send them now. Otherwise, we may not be able to address them. Um, this question uh, connects with your comment on Israel and the Black Panther uh, in Israel. What do you think? was the overall impact of his speaking out against Israel? Mm, yeah, um, it's actually quite... <laughs> um, so, so SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinator Committee, um, had been the sort of radical student um, sort of led um, part of, of the civil rights movement. It worked very closely, in the, it worked in the South, very closely with, you know, with Martin Luther King um, as well and the other sorts of rights movements. In, um, SNCC had a lot of white support and among them a lot of Jewish support um, as well, right? So sort of liberal, liberal Jews had a lot of support for liberal Jews. Now, around 66, maybe even before that, there's a sort of shift in SNCC, right? Where you sort of have a, rad a more radical wing, which is sort of Toure, this is H. Rap Brown as well, um, who are sort of becoming radicalized. Um, and then you have a sort of, and then you have a sort of, you know, another wing basically, um, which is wants to keep things as they are. And Tory and, 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 and Rap Brown um, basically sort of say that, you know, we don't need like funding from these white people. We need to, th this is a black power organization now and we need to fund ourselves, right? And from that point on, you start to see a drop in funding going, going to SNCC. However, when they come out um, in support of the Palestinians and against um, Israel in a six day war, um, I mean, that really is, 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 is a death knell for the organization. I mean, it's accused of anti-Semitism. Um, you, you really sort of see, you know, big figures um, start to disassociate and to condemn it. Um, and, and, and that, I mean, that, that really is the sort of the straw that, that broke the camel's back, the, um, the sort of backlash um, that SNCC had um, after it came out in 67 um, against Israel. And, and, you, and you know, th there's a point where, um, you know, it can't play, it pay its electricity bill and it's Atlanta headquarters and Chicago headquarters doesn't have this or that. The phone, I think, is cut. And it's sort of, you can sort of see it sort of um, being dissolved. But, but I, think, I think it's important to understand that the, 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 the funding to SNCC was already um, sort of in decline um, before they released that statement um, about, about Israel, basically. Okay, I have um, two questions. I'll ask you one at a time. Excellent presentation, Amanda. Can we also look at the contributions of George Padmore on Pan-Africanism? Of course, that would be a big one. Huh? Yeah. But uh, so can just summarize for us. Okay, okay. I mean, I, I mean, I mean, of course, you know, Pad Padmore, despite as we spoke, um, his um, this rift of Nkrumah, I mean, he's recognized as one of the founding fathers of Ghana, right? You know, with, you know, along with Du Bois um, and Nkrumah. So, I mean, Padmore is immortalized um, already as one of the sort of, as one of the founding fathers and, you know, Padmore's role really. So for what I understand, CLR James um, wrote to Padmore to introduce him to Nkrumah. And Padmore, of course, was the driving force behind the, the 45 uh, 
you know, conference in, in Manchester, basically, right? Um, which basically called for um, the independence of, independence of African countries, right? Um, and and Ekuma was was attending that conference. So, I mean, I mean, Padua is, is is a significant um, figure when it comes to um, the history of Pan Africanism, and 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 he's he significant. I mean, yes, you know, as a sort of mentor to Nkrumah, um, but also, but also through his activism, actually, in fact, as well, right? Um, when you when you look when you when you read like Padmore's journalism in like the twenties and the thirties, um, he's, I mean, you know, he's constantly linking what's happening in Africa to, to what's happening in America. I mean, I mean, it's, it's, I, I, it was it was a big eye opener for me actually when I when I was introduced to like Padmore's work, and I still I'm still quite ignorant about it. I I, I should I I should say so. Don't please don't take this as a as an expert talking um but i think yeah i think he made fantastic um contributions towards pan-africanism both uh, in in theory and, and also in practice yeah i think it would be remiss of me if i don't ask you to make some connection between uh black power and the current movement to decolonize public spaces and decolonize the memorials particularly those memorials to imperialist and colonialist criminals that are forced upon us, forced into our curriculum and so on. Um, could you provide some uh, enlightenment for us and perhaps um, give sure. us some encouragement to move forward as well? Absolutely. I mean, I think, I think as I said before, that, you know, and, and, you know, I think James Baldwin really put it so well when he said that black power is like, Kwame Ture didn't invent black power. It has always been there and he just revived it, right? And black power, you know, in, in one guys, you could even say that, you know, Marcus Garvey is, a, is an expression of black power, right? And, and his injunction to emancipate yourself from mental slavery is such a powerful injunction that you really see carries, carries through the black power movement, the Afro, you know, black and beautiful, you know, all, you know, all that sort of stuff, right? And emancipating, you know, our to mental slavery um, must also, you know, entail how we how we educate ourselves, right? Um, who we hold um, to be dear, the people that we that we honor, the people that we, you know, follow. Um, and as we, you know, you know as we know, um, unfortunately, um, part of the indo indoctrination of colonialism, its legacies, was to place um, certain figures as being honorable, certain figures as being contributors um, to um, the Caribbean, Christopher Columbus, for example, right? Um, in, in Britain, Edward Colston, we had a statue of Edward Colston who was just horrific um, slave trader, right? Um, and so in, to, to truly eman emancipate ourselves from mental slavery, it is really important for us to be very clear about who we consider to be those figures worthy of worship, not worship, worthy of praise, excuse me, worthy of praise and honor, and those who are dishonorable, right? Um, because we'll have generations going down the line, you would take these people as being, oh, well, you know, Columbus wasn't, you know, wasn't, you know, wasn't so bad, and, you know, like, you know, you know, sort of equivocated, you know, you know, his statues just there, and, you know, and, you know, in Port of Spain, you know, it can't be so bad, and blah, you know? Um, so I think, I think we just have to be very clear about that. Um, I think that, um, you know, statues, aren't you know everything um and it's easy easy to get it's too easy to get hung up on on a statue and not realize um the statue is kind of it, it, you know it's almost a sort of a, a manifestation um of something much deeper um, a malaise that you might see in the education system um that you might see in in certain frames of thinking um that we ourselves have as well um, so the statues shouldn't be seen as an end in and of themselves, but they are a dangerous um, sort of reminder, um, you know, of the legacies of colonialism, and they need to be they need to be dealt with. Yeah, we are uh, pressed for time. We have to end the session, but before that, I want to ask you a question from the audience that touches a, a more personal, uh, and it's the question: What role? Did your parents play in the Black Power movement mm -hmm. and the raising of consciousness? And uh, after you answer that question, I want you to take a few minutes to summarize, you know, the important points that you raised in the lecture. 
just sure. briefly. Sure. Yeah. And I th yeah. Thank you very much for that question. So, um, as I said, my my, my father's um, inaugural job in the Black Power movement was to was to was to manufacture these these cones um, for um, for people to you know people who are growing afros to you know to use in their hair. And um, I, I, just as an aside, I actually found this out. My father passed away in 2014, and uh, in Tobago uh, at his at his funeral, an uncle of mine was telling me this story. And as he was telling the story, um, Lloyd Lloyd Phillips, he, he taught at UWE actually as well, um, is my great uncle. And as he was telling me the story, he took out a comb and started combing his afro. And then he, and then, he, then he looked at the comb and he said, this is the same comb your father made for me back in 1970, that power revolution. So I was, I was, I was really chuffed by that. But um, what, what was interesting about the combs is that my father went to Britain on a scholarship to become an engineer. And I don't know how, but he became a publisher, right? Um, and I kind of thought about it. And, you know, as much as a, as a publisher is delivering information um they're also making books they're also putting together manufacturing books and packaging ideas and all this sort of stuff so i kind of drew a thread um and his his press carrier press um during the 1980s and into the 90s was one of the, the sort of major um black radical um publishing houses um it it, it published the first collection by um by a great um ein Paul springer um it published um First collection by Merle Collins, a Grenadian poet, Eileen Thomas, the, 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 the Jamaican. Um, it, it published um, uh, our, 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 our other great um, uh, scholar, and his, and his name, uh, you might have to help me here, um, African Survivors in Trinidad and Tobago. Um, J.D. Elder um, as well, um, a very important co a contributor to our understanding of, of sort of Africanity in Trinidad and Tobago. Um, and, that, and, and he also wrote um, the first book on Claudia Jones, I'm the noted Trinidadian um, um, activist. My, 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 um, my mother, um, who, who left Trinidad at 14 um, for the UK, um, she was heavily involved in education. In education. Um, she, she set up her first um, supplementary school for black children, um, I think around 50 years ago, actually, um, in, um, in her living room. And, and still today, um, each Saturday, you can find her at one of these Saturday schools um, helping to teach um, black children. Um, in in 82, 1982, she co-founded, I believe 82, the, the, the Claudia Jones organization, um, which assists um, black women and families um, in, in, in our neighborhood in, in, you know, in Hackney and in, in London and beyond, and is still sort of going strong um, today. So she's been involved in, in sort of consciousness raising, education, um, and just, just community work um, um, forever and ever. <laughs> um, and, it's, and it's still going, it's very much going strong. Um, yeah, so yeah, th thank, you for, thank you for that question. I appreciate it. Yeah, just a brief wrap up. Yeah, so um, to, to, to summarize today, um, my, my argument is that Kwame Ture, um, as, we, as we know him you know, in his fullest extent, um, has not, his story has not been fully told. Um, we tend to hear about the 16 years he spent living in the United States when he was known as Stokely Carmichael. Uh, we don't hear much about his Trinidad and Tobagonian roots um, and, his, uh, and, his, and his upbringing there until the age of 11, nor do we hear about the 30 or so years he spent living in Guinea um, until he passed away in 1998. This period he lived in Guinea um, is really um, a period of, of, of evolution, of transformation, where he goes from a black power activist and becomes a pan-Africanist and a global um, revolutionary um, as well. Um, throughout this period, um, he leads the All African People's Revolutionary Party, which becomes the largest such party across Africa and the diaspora. And he also um, um, supports other movements, including the Palestinians um, and including everybody from Sinn Féin to the Polisario Front of Western Sahara um, um, as well. Um, I also mentioned um, that um, I was able to go to Guinea and speak to people who, who knew Touré intimately, especially in his own late neighborhood, um, of Rotoma, and this, you know, this wasn't a person who was, um, you know, speaking, you know, you know, a sort of celebrity. Uh, in fact, um, uh, you know, who, you know, who only sort of spoke to diplomats and leaders and, and, and politicians, whatever. Right there in his own community, he was supporting um, African people, right, um, sharing in their suffering. Um, he was, um, you know, sacrificing. He was giving what he had. Um, he was helping children. Um, to swim even every every Sunday, in fact. 
Um, and so he was making local contributions as well. And for me, that was that was a, a real eye, eye opener. That 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 sort of confirmed for me that um, that there was there, there was a deep and profound sincerity um, to the bigger work, the work that was getting the headlines, the work that everyone knows about. Um, that he was doing this quiet work, um, you know, at the weekend or whenever he could, um, seemed to confirm um, the sincerity of his, of, you know, of his intentions as a Pan Africanist. Okay, uh, thank you so much, my brother. Thank, thank you, you, thank you, here, thank here. you for such thank a you. wonderful lecture this evening. I want to thank the audience as well uh, for coming out to listen to this special lecture and also for your questions and comments. I want to thank my technical team without whom we would not be able to have an event such as this. And of course, before we formally end this evening's event, I want to make a few announcements. First, let me highlight the main events on the Pan-African Festival schedule. Next Sunday, that's the 18th of June, we host the Yoruba Village Drum Festival. That's an annual event. This is our first face-to-face -face event since 2019. On that day, the Emancipation Support Committee will unveil its second monument. And this one is in honor of the Yoruba diaspora in Trinidad. Uh, their first monument, appropriately called Arise, can be located at the scene of the Proclamation of Emancipation in front of the Treasury Building. On the 26th of June, we have the fashion show, the fashion extravaganza, Ewa Africa. I believe it's at City Hall, I stand corrected, but you can check the site of the ESC. You have uh, numbers you can call, you can go on the website, ESC website and check it out. And also ticket, you can check all those things. That's the 26th of June. And on the 29th of July, that's Friday, we have the opening of the Lidge Yasu Omawale Village. And of course, that would be followed by the e market, the, the market, the largest African market in the Caribbean, African fabrics, food and sale, all sorts of things that you can think about on the continent. You can come there and get it. And of course, on Emancipation Morning, we are back on the streets again. Uh, after, since 2019, we are back on the streets with the street procession from the site of the reading of the Emancipation Proclamation down to the Emancipation Village. Now, the following dates are for the rest of the Kwame Memorial Lecture Series. On the 3rd of July, we host a panel discussion on the challenges in education for the African child. We have our keynote presenter there is a youthful minister of education of Anguilla, Mrs. Diane Kentish Roberts. And she has implemented a no discrimination policy against African hairstyle in Anguilla with all name types of African hairstyles. So she has been leading in that direction and setting an example for other Caribbean governments to follow. Um, the big focus this year uh, would be on education, sorry. We have a number of other people on that panel, but because of time, we would not list all of them. On the 10th of July, we host a panel discussion on decolonizing public spaces. Uh, with a number of young activists from the Caribbean, from Britain and the United States. On the 17th of July, all these are Sundays, the panel discussion will discuss the situation in Haiti. And we have a number of high profile panelists on this one. And the final event in this year's series is a feature lecture by Rene Cummins entitled Decolonizing Data and Democratizing Artificial Intelligence. You can uh, follow the Emancipation Supporty, Support Committee's 
website for details on uh, each of these panels. Keep checking and uh, we hope to see you at all of them. We hope to see you at all of them. And this, 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 this evening's uh, lecture is to whet your appetite. We have a lot more of exciting panels to follow. Thank you very much. Good evening and uh, see you again soon.